Hello everyone, in this episode of What The Fast, we're gonna take a look at the differences between an oil catch can and oil air separator, how they work, and most importantly, why you need one. Now, oil catch cans and oil air separators are one of those things that every car enthusiast has heard of, probably thinks that they need one, but doesn't truly understand why they need one or how different setup of catch cans can work and all the variables associated with them. Now, before we look at how a catch can or oil air separator works, first we have to look at why they even exist in the first place. And that is quite simply just due to crank case ventilation. So one of the byproducts of the combustion process with your engine is that when the explosion happens during the combustion cycle and pushes down on the cylinder, as it comes down the cylinder, some of those exhaust gases will actually go around the piston and make it past the piston rings. And where is that exhaust gas going to go? Well, it's going to go down and inside the block itself. And as you know, the block and head are attached to each other. You've got oil feed and oil drains. So all of that exhaust gas can go not only inside the block, it'll go back up into the head and basically pressurize all of the inside of your engine other than the cooling system, because they don't want to meet up. And basically that all builds up inside and what happens if you don't let it out? Well, it can break oil seals, it can push out the main seal, uh, either rear or front, uh, it can push out your dipstick, uh, or lead to a catastrophic engine failure if you don't release any crankcase pressure whatsoever. Now back in the old days, they pretty much just let it, well, come out of the engine and go into the atmosphere, but then we became all conscious about the environment and emissions kicked in. So what are we gonna do with this crankcase pressure? All of this pressurized air inside the engine, where's it gonna go? It's filled with contaminants and fuel and oil. So they decided the most efficient and best way to get rid of it is to basically put it back into the engine and let it go into the cylinders and get burnt up and go back out through the exhaust and catalytic converters. If you can imagine the rocker covers on top of the engine or the cam covers, they'll have a breather or an outlet for that crankcase pressure and they'll just run a line uh, out of those. They'll have one that goes to the inlet manifold via a PCV or a one-way valve uh, and then they'll have another one that just goes into the inlet tract. Now the reason they have one that goes into the inlet is if you can imagine the throttle body up here when the throttle body is not fully open, you have vacuum inside the inlet manifold and essentially that vacuum helps suck air out of the engine. So not only is the uh, pressurized air inside your engine trying to get out, you've also got the vacuum inside the inlet manifold helping suck it out as well. But when you're at full throttle, you don't have any vacuum here anymore, so it just blows straight in. Uh, and the other line that they'll have off a cam cover generally is that'll blow into the inlet tract. Uh, obviously there won't be any pressure in there in a naturally aspirated car. If anything, there might be a tiny bit of vacuum, so that's another way to get that air in. Now in a turbocharged engine application, this PCV valve or one-way valve becomes even more important. Why? Well, there's boost pressure inside the inlet manifold, and you can imagine if you've got boost pressure in here, you've got crankcase pressure here, they're trying to fight each other and the boost pressure will win and now you've got air going into the engine. So this one-way valve stops any air from the inlet manifold going back into the engine. So essentially, once a turbocharged car comes on to boost, this valve doesn't vent anything anymore from inside the engine to getting outside of the engine. So now, the line on this side or the other line that they'll have on one of the cam covers will go into the intake pipe before the turbo. Why is that? Well, if you can imagine, if you're now making boost pressure, this turbo is sucking in air from the airbox, so it'll help suck air out of the engine in the same way that this would if there was vacuum over here. Uh, so yeah, it comes out of the cam cover into the intake, runs through the turbo and all of the turbo system and into the engine that way. So when you've got vacuum in here, the PCV valve is open. When you have boost in here, it all comes out and goes in this side. So we've kind of talked about now what happens with crankcase ventilation and how that comes about and where it needs to go. Now let's talk about why it's bad and you don't want it inside your engine. Firstly, what you need to understand is that blow-by gases start inside the combustion chamber. So they're gonna have carbon in there as a leftover byproduct of the air fuel ratio burning. There's gonna be leftover fuel in there, especially when you're on E85, and all sorts of other contaminants from the combustion process. And this is before it even goes through the block in the head and picks up a bunch of oil vapor on the way through as well. Now, if you've ever heard a service department say that you need a throttle body clean as part of a service, well, this is why. Essentially, 
all of that gunk and all that oil vapor that goes back into your inlet tract and then goes onto the front of your throttle body, your throttle body gets filthy dirty. So as part of a service, they want to clean that throttle body for a few reasons. One, that buildup can make the throttle body get stuck. It can make your idle go a little bit funny because the, all those contaminants are stopping the throttle body from closing properly. So that's why they want to do that. Now, as you can imagine, once it goes past the throttle body, where's the next place it's going to go? Well, all those contaminants are going to build up inside the ports and they're going to build up on the back of your valves. Over time, it'll stop the valve from sealing properly. Um, it can also affect the way the air fuel uh, mixture is moving through the ports as well. Now, on a port injection car where the fuel injector sprays inside the runners, that fuel can help clean some of the deposits off the back of a valve. But in a direct injection or a diesel car, you don't get that. So they suffer from the buildup of carbon deposits even worse. So the blow-by is responsible for the inside of your engine getting dirty and a whole bunch of oil and additive manufacturers trying to sell you all these type of cylinder head cleans, etc. But another thing that people don't realize that this oil vapor and contaminants does is it actually dilutes the air fuel ratio mixture. Now, if you know anything about oil, you know it hasn't got as high an octane rating as fuel. So if your car is running on a premium unleaded of some sort or a very good type of fuel, this blow-by going back into the inlet tract and mixing with the fuel effectively lowers your octane rating. What does that mean? Well, you're gonna suffer from detonation a lot easier. Uh, the car will probably try and pull timing out of it. It's on the edge and you simply just can't make as much power. Now on a turbocharged engine, that gets even worse. Now we mentioned earlier that in a turbocharged car, one of the breather lines goes to the intake to the turbo. So where do those oil contaminants end up? right here in your turbocharger. Now remember, they're not filtered, so whatever's floating around in your engine in that oil vapor can end up going through here. Now sometimes when you pull a turbo off an older mileage car, you'll actually find that oil pools inside the compressor cover. I haven't cleaned this one, but look at that. Just wipe your finger on it, and look how much crap comes off, and that's just purely due to the engine breathing and it going back in through the intake. You can even get oil pull up inside the turbo. Does it damage it? Eh. You'd have to get a lot of build up to actually do turbo damage. Uh, and by the time you've got to that point, there's probably a lot of other things wrong with your car as well. Now, another thing that gets affected by blow by on a turbocharged car is the intercooler for a few reasons. Firstly, if you can imagine that oil vapor mist going through the intercooler, it actually coats the intercooler inside with a very fine coat of oil. Now, if you understand how intercoolers work, what it's trying to do essentially is cool the air down. Now, Aluminium is used in intercoolers because it transfers heat very well between air and the metal. So as the air goes through, it wants to, you know, if it touches the metal, the air going through it then helps pull the heat out of the air. But if you now have oil between the alloy and the air, it's not as good as transferring heat. So you actually lose some efficiency of your intercooler if you have a lot of blow by and stuff inside your intercooler. Some cars even suffer from getting condensation inside the intercooler. You can feel it, it's pretty cold. So you get condensation inside because of that hot oil vapor and leaving that residue. And then you end up with water inside your intercooler as well. Known problem in some Ford engines over in America is to get water inside from condensation, which causes a, a misfire and bad cold starts and things like that. You'll even notice on some cars, especially turbo diesels, you pull the intercooler out and you tip it on its side and you will just get oil leak out of the intercooler. So um, that can be pretty bad. So looking at crankcase ventilation and blow-by can actually help you understand why that even a brand new engine can lose oil over time. And obviously older engines, they consume more oil over time as well. The oil isn't leaking out of the engine, it's just coming out of the breathers and getting consumed by the engine. That's why manufacturers say it's completely normal for a certain amount of oil to be consumed between oil changes. So if all this stuff is so bad for your engine, especially on turbocharged cars, why do manufacturers do it? Well, they only have to worry about the car when it's brand new. Don't get as much blow-by when it's brand new. And they don't have to worry about it when it's done 200,000 Ks. And secondly, emissions is their number one priority. So uh, that is more important than every last piece of performance and longevity out of the engine. So what's the difference between a catch can and an oil separator? Well, a catch can vents to atmosphere, usually through a filter if you want to do it correctly, while an oil air separator has a line come in, as the name suggests, tries to separate the air and the oil, and then it comes back out and goes back through your engine. So it is a sealed system. Now, whether 
whether it's a catch can or an oil air separator, they're both trying to do the same thing. They are both trying to make the oil and air separate. Essentially, the oil vapor turns back into a liquid and gets collected inside the can. So we have a look here. Now, instead of going through the PCV valve, one line's gonna come over into the catch can. This line will also go into the catch can. And then you can either go out and go to atmosphere, making it a catch can, or you have another line that goes back in like this, making it oil air separator. Now the other big thing between the two of them is one is legal, and one isn't. An oil catch can is illegal. Why? Well, it's venting to atmosphere, so it breaches all emission laws. An oil air separator is legal because the lines that come out into the oil air separator, you have a line that goes back into the intake and is a totally sealed system. Now, whether it's a catch can or oil air separator, they're both trying to do the same thing, and that is separate the oil and the air. Now there's a few different ways that can be done, but essentially what you'll find is you'll just have a series of baffles of some type inside. And the whole idea is that as air runs through any types of baffles or any types of metal filters, as the air runs over a metal surface, the oil will attach to the metal surface, turn back into a liquid. And what does it do? It all starts to pull up and collect back inside the catch can or separator. So we'll open up this oil air separator and you can see that the oil air vapor will go in through this side. Out of that hole, uh, there's a little disc here for the oil to try and attach to before it sinks into the bottom and also stops it from sloshing around. But if you have a look, there is a metal filter here. Now air can get through this metal filter, but oil won't. The oil vapor as it hits this metal filter will basically turn back into a liquid. It'll drop back down into here, drop back down into here and get collected. So. Whether it's a catch can or oil air separator, they both do that. As well as being illegal, another disadvantage of ones to atmosphere is if you can imagine, you just got a little filter here on the side of your catch can and there's still oil vapor inside there that's coming out. It never gets all of it. So you do end up with a little bit of fine mist of oil going into your engine bay. Um, but if you ever have any major issues, an engine fail, or you get more blow by due to more boost, uh, you've probably had a mate where you've opened his engine and you've just seen oil go everywhere. So that is one big disadvantage of a catch can if you don't get the size correct or if you have any type of engine issues. So as the oil starts to fill up your catch can or oil air separator, you've got to get rid of it. Now you've got two options here. You can either have a little drain on the bottom or in this instance of this one, we have a little drain plug where you can just undo it and let the oil out. Or your other option is you can return this back to the sump of your engine. Now this is where the big argument with a catch can starts. Do you return it to the sump or do you let it sit in the catch can and not return it to the sump? Now when it comes to whether or not you should make your catch can return to the sump, there's three things you need to be concerned about. One is pressure differential. Secondly is how much size you have in your engine bay. And lastly, contamination. Now, with a turbocharged car, what's gonna happen is, if you have a return into the sump, it actually becomes another breather for the engine when there's a lot of crankcase pressure. So yes, it's trying to come out the rocker covers, but RBs obviously are notoriously known for it. The engine will actually try and breathe out of this return line from the catch can. So when you're obviously on full noise, especially in a big power turbocharged thing, you've now got boosted air, that's contaminated all that oil vapor. It's trying to force its way back out here, back out and into the catch can backwards. So it can't actually drain in some cars when you're on full throttle. Now, obviously the bigger you make that drain, um, yeah, look, you might overpower it eventually, but if you've got big blow by inside the engine like you do in an RB, uh, it will try and force its way out. And obviously this catch can's filling up more and more and more as you stay on full noise um, and it isn't gonna drain. However, if you can imagine you're going down the quarter mile, you're pulling gears, you're only doing it for you know, nine seconds if you've got a decent GTR. As long as you're not filling up that catch can in that nine seconds, well then you're fine. Because what will happen is as soon as you lift the throttle, boom, it'll all go back into the sump. Now obviously on a naturally aspirated car, this isn't something you have to worry about. This is just for turbocharged cars. So make sure that you have a catch can that's big enough to allow it to fill up while it's under boost and then it will drain off obviously once boost is gone. One thing that some people do though is they add a one-way valve here. 
So if you put a one-way valve on, you can't get any air trying to come out the wrong way and boost its way back out, but it's a one-way valve, so the oil can drain back through. Just make sure you've got a one-way valve, though, that will open without pressure on it so it can actually drain. So that's another way to do it. So the next thing you've got to consider, obviously, is the size in your engine bay. Um, if you have a one-litre catch can like this on a turbocharged car, you're probably going to have to drain it back to the sump because uh, you're going to be draining it all the time. Something like this, this will definitely need a drain on it. Uh, and then when you get into GTR territory, you start thinking about having catch cans this big. So if your engine bay won't fit a big enough catch can, well then you're probably going to have to make it return to the sump or you're going to be emptying it every time you drive it, which I can tell you from owning a GDR, sucks. Now the most important thing to consider and the one that causes all of the internet arguments with a catch can about whether you should return to the sump or not is contamination. Now you can imagine all these blow-by gases are filled with carbon deposits and contaminants we spoke about earlier. They're already going into your engine. They're already swirling around inside the block and swirling around the head and infecting your oil with the contaminants. It is happening anyway. So what do you do? Well, you make sure you do regular oil changes, service it more often if you've got a modified car, uh, and use really good quality oil. And the main reason oil has detergents in it is to clean up all that crap inside your engine. So when you talk about returning to sump, the contaminants that are going through there, it's happening anyway. So you don't really have to worry about that so much. On a 98 or you know normal petrol car, the amount of fuel that ends up inside that as a contaminant is not a whole lot, to be perfectly honest. When it does become a problem is when you've got E85. Now, E85 cars breathe more. It's as simple as that. If you switch from 98 to E85, your engine is going to breathe more. Uh, we could go into why, but we'd be here for a very long time. Let's just accept the fact that they do. Now, another thing that cars on E85 have is what they call oil contamination. A lot of fuel makes its way into your oil and contaminates your oil, and obviously that fuel is in the vapour and the crankcase ventilation that comes out. Now, when you get a car in 85 that doesn't return to the sump and you empty the catch can, what a lot of people find is they have, you know, 100 mils of oil, they'll have half a litre of 85 but then they'll have half a litre of water as well. And that's the bit that confuses and scares a lot of people when it comes to whether you should return your catch can. Now, what you need to understand is that water inside your catch can hasn't come out of your engine, hasn't come out of the fuel. It's actually just condensation from water vapour that's in the air. And it doesn't happen until you turn your engine off. And what happens is all of that alloy starts to cool down. And then because you've got E85 in there that causes condensation, then you start to get moisture in there and then you start to get water in there. In the same way that you have to worry about E85 getting water in the fuel tank, you have that same problem in your catch can. So a lot of people, when they pour out their catch can and they see all that, they get scared and they don't want it in their engine. But what you have to remember is that water won't be there if you're constantly draining because it doesn't, if it's draining back to the sump and sitting back in here now, all of that condensation here will be massively reduced because the 85 is now back down in the sump. The other thing you have to remember is while the engine's running and it's all the oil temperatures are warm, you are burning off that E85 and you're burning off any moisture that might happen. One example to give is if cars run 85, if you start them up on cold start, move it outside and turn it off, and then don't warm it up, and at the end of the day, you just quickly start it, move it back inside the workshop and turn it off, you'll notice after two weeks that the oil in that car has turned green because it just has massive amounts of E85 and moisture that's made its way into the engine oil, which is the reason why you need to either A, make sure you always warm up your car on E85, don't just start it and warm it around cold. You should always give it a bit of a hit if you're on E85 when you drive it, just to help burn off all the excess E85 and any moisture. Uh, and lastly, you should do more common oil changes on E85. Instead of servicing every 10,000 Ks, I service it every 2,000 Ks or even after every track day just to make sure you look after the engine. So bear in mind, when the car's running, you're not gonna get that condensation build up. It's gonna drain back in and the engine will naturally burn off any excess E85 and any excess moisture that's floating around. So, it's up to you really. So I used to be a firm believer of not draining back to the sump, but things change, you learn more and then realize you pretty much do need to do it in a lot of performance applications, and what we've been through with our project cars has proven that. So let's take a look at some real world examples. So first example is our Time Attack car, Jet 200. When we first built that engine in 2011, and we ran it in on 98 pump fuel, I'd be lucky if I lost 50 mils of oil after a dyno session, or even after a session on track. But as soon as we switched to E85, I noticed I'd have over a litre in my catch can after one dyno session, and we were filling up a catch can every time we went out on track. Now obviously as the power went up over the years, this just got worse and worse, until we reached the point where this 
is now the catch can that we have on Jet 200. And we had to add this extra section in to catch it all. We have a drain at the bottom so we can drain it in between each session. But even with a catch can this big, we still have to drain it in Jet 200 every time we do a session out on track. Now, because it's a time attack car, I'm not too worried about that. I, you know, I'm happy just to drain it after each session as part of the maintenance of looking after the car uh, and looking over it after each session. But if it was a street car, that would be very, very annoying. Now let's talk about GTRs, a car that is known to have terrible oil control if you don't know what you're doing. Now RB26 is when you put a high volume oil pump in, they obviously pump more oil through the system. So more of it's getting up into the head, combine that with obviously breathing from high boost pressure and you're asking for more oil to get pumped out of the cam cover. But the other problem that you have is when you accelerate, all the oil that's trapped in the head, so not the blow by, just physical oil gets forced to the back of the cam cover it pulls around the back and then obviously the blow-by just wants to push it out. So it's a double whammy when it comes to GTRs. Now obviously there's ways to fix that. There's head drains, there's head restrictors in large sumps, there's baffles and there's cam covers that are different and all sorts of things and we've got other videos all about that. So let's take a look at what we went through with our GTR to get it right. So when our GTR had a stock bottom end, it had a stock oil pump, so it wasn't high volume, so we didn't really have too many problems. We just had high octane rocker cover baffles inside our cam covers. Uh, we had a pretty generic high octane racing catch can. We just ran rubber hoses from the cam covers to here. Uh, we blocked off the drain, and then this, this outlet here, or the breather, which in hindsight was probably a bit small, we actually just ran a tube to the back of the car. Um, and it vented to atmosphere. Now, when you watch the car launch, sometimes you could see a little bit of oil come out if it was full, or a little bit of vapor come out, etc. It's pretty normal for a GTR that's breathing like that. Um, we could do a day at Power Cruise or a day at Cootamundra before we had to empty the catch can out, but for general driving, I, I didn't have to empty it out very often. Now, when we built our engine and made it rev to 9,500 RPM and put a Nitto high volume oil pump on it, things changed completely. So this was a great learning experience with me with my GTR, not necessarily by choice, to put all of the things that I'd learned in theory into practice when it comes to catch cans and an RB having breathing problems. Now the first catch can I didn't design, twin dash 12 inlets to match up with the dash 12 off the cam covers, which is fine, uh, but it only had one filter underneath. Now the filter was larger than one of these, but not as big as two of these. So my first theory was the filter is smaller than the holes going into it, therefore it's gonna back up pressure and it might not be able to breathe enough. Um, unfortunately, my theory came true. And what actually happened on our GTR is um, we had push-in fittings into the cam cover it actually blew them out. So we straight away knew, well, we better go and weld the actual fittings onto the cam cover. So there's a tip for everybody. Don't use push-in dash 12 fittings into RB26 cam covers. If you can't breathe good enough, you'll blow them straight out and oil will go everywhere. Even after sorting that problem on the dyno, the next problem we had is the car actually started to blow smoke out of the exhaust. And we're like, what the hell? It's a brand new engine. Why is it smoking out of the exhaust? Well, you already know why, and that's because it couldn't breathe well enough out through the catch can. So what we did as an experiment on the dyno is we undid one of the ho Dash 12 hoses and just put that straight into a, a cordial bottle and let that breathe into the atmosphere separate. As soon as we did that, the engine stopped smoking and we didn't have any more blow-by issues. So what does that tell you? Well, you need to make sure that your catch can can breathe as much or more than what the lines coming out of your rocker covers can do. So after all that, I redesigned the catch can to have the same two Dash 12 inlets, the same baffles inside, but two filters underneath. So now I can make sure that the filters can breathe more than what these two Dash 12s can flow. Now I thought that would make things better, and it did driving around normally, car stopped smoking and everything seemed fine. But then when I went to Cootamundra, the next problem happened. Now our RB26 now revs to 9,500 RPM. Now if you can imagine going from first to the top of fifth and staying pretty much above 7,000 RPM the entire time, and you've got a high volume oil pump, there is a lot of oil that is getting up inside here, forcing its way up to the back here and breathing out. Quite simply, the amount of oil that would come out of an RB26 that still has a wet sump at that sort of RPM and that sort of power, just fills this up in one run. That's right, there's nothing wrong with the engine, it's got no problems, but an RB26 with a high volume pump will fill up a catch can this big in one quarter mile run. So what did I do? Simple, I had to return to sump. The moment I put a return to sump from here back to our aftermarket sump, 
The car has never had any more blow-by issues whatsoever. Now in terms of contamination, I've taken a look at the oil after I've pulled it out from before I made it drain the sump and after I drained the sump. And because I changed the oil so often, I couldn't notice any difference in the oil coloration or, or in terms of any contamination. There's no 85 contamination. And like I said, I just make sure I look after the car in the 85. I make sure I start it and warm it up and drive it every time I start it. If I've only got to move it outside, I push it uh, and I just do more common oil changes uh, more often than what you would if you're on 98, just to look after the health of the oil. Now I do want to leave you with this. If you're looking at oil catch cans or oil air separators and you look inside it and there's no baffles, well, guess what? It's not an oil air separator or catch can. Without the baffles or filters inside, it will not do the job of separating the oil out of the actual air. So when you're looking, make sure there's baffles inside. If not, it doesn't work. And the person trying to sell it to you is an idiot. Now, the last thing that you're probably all asking is what size catch can and how should you lay out the catch can in your car? Well, the problem is, is every engine combination, every car, is different. What works on one car just does not work on the other. I've already shown you on a big power GDR or the wet sump, this isn't big enough to be a catch can that doesn't go back to the sump. But on our WRX circuit car, this one litre catch can not returning to sump is big enough that after a day at the track doing 50 laps of Wakefield, I emptied this and 150 to 200 mils came out. Uh, but mind you, that car hasn't got a lot of power and it's on 98 fuel. Uh, so it really does depend on what sort of application, driving style, engine setup, power, how old it is, etc. But one thing I will say is, an oil air separator like this, maybe slightly larger probably, is a really good investment on pretty much any turbo diesel or any direct injection car, just to try and get rid of some of the contaminants that are going onto the back of the valves uh, and clogging things up. So there you have it recommend that you put an oil air separator on pretty much any road car you own and a catch can on any race car you own um, but what size and what layout that's the hard part right all depends on the application but just remember this if you're having problems just go bigger and bigger and bigger until you get it right